Welcome to the Ages of Rock podcast with your hosts, Bill Algy, Dennis Talbot, and Alan Tate. We are three guys who have one thing in common, a love of rock and roll. Our goal is to talk about all things rock. We hope you find this show intriguing, funny, and occasionally highly opinionated. Enjoy. All right, this is episode uh, 92 of the Ages of Rock podcast, and tonight we have on the phone John Regan. Hello, John. Hey, Hi guys, uh, listen. Did you say did you say episode ninety two? Yes. Yeah. No, nah, I, I can't do it. But I don't like that number. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to call me back after a couple more. I, I prefer like ninety five, ninety six. So, uh, well, you know what? We're on the phone now. Why don't we have a chat? <laughs> How you doing, idea. guys? There doing you go. Fine. How Thank you. How you doing? Everything's great, man. I'm up uh, up here in New York. We're uh, we're just uh, getting into autumn, my favorite time of the year. So it's 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 beautiful. It's hotter uh, than Hades down here in the big Midwest of Indiana because it's uh, like it where, where are you guys? Indianapolis. I'm just south of Indianapolis, and I'm southern uh, Indiana, and it's like been like the heat index of right around 100 for like the last week. Oh man! Till about Thursday, right. I think Thursday we're going to get a break. Hopefully. <laughs> it's like yeah. it's, it's I, well, I, I love it out in your neck of the woods. I've always uh I've been touring for the better part of forty years and, and Indiana is always one of the favorite stops. Thank you. Cool. Well I have to I'll have to you come guys, check you out. You guys knew how to rock all the way back for from you know first tour I did was in nineteen seventy one and uh wow. I just remember uh, great memories of uh of Indianapolis and, and uh Fort Wayne and there used to be a, a club called Oh, what was the name of that club in Fort Wayne? The Zigzag Club. Oh, in Fort cool. Wayne, Indiana. Played there with a band called Bull Angus, and we opened for Mop the Hoople. Oh, oh cool. Did you ever make it to yeah. uh, Evansville, Indiana, which is in the southern tip? Of course. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. That's where actually Alan Anything. and I are from. We're actually living in near Evansville. And Bill is from Evansville. He's just moved to Columbus near Indianapolis. So, <laughs> oh, Another great Columbus is great, too. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of wonderful memories of touring in the Midwest. That, you know, that 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 whole, uh, you know, the mid Cleveland Rocks and Detroit Rock City, and I guess we need to <laughs> come up with an Indianapolis or Columbus or Fort Wayne rock song. Exactly. <laughs> Evansville's a country town now, so there's nobody rock, no rock shows uh, go there that are worth anything. So uh, that changed. Uh, Too close to Nashville. Uh, Unfortunately. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. So what uh, are you up to these days, John? I'm sorry. What are you up to these days? Uh, I'm probably about 195. Unfortunately, <laughs> I need to lose about 20 pounds. That's great. You got the rest of us beat by now, we're, uh, how many pounds? <laughs> <laughs> now we're uh, everything's everything's great. We just uh, I'm still coming down off a uh, off of a pretty amazing experience uh, last Friday in Poughkeepsie, New York, with uh, my band Four by Fate. Yes, we. Uh, supported Ace Fraley uh, at the Chance in Poughkeepsie and um, we had a great show and then Ace was uh, nice enough to invite Todd and myself and uh, our guitarist Pat Gasparini up for a little jam session so it really was uh, it was a great homecoming and uh, there's nothing like the feeling of, of getting back on stage with people you've been in a band with because you know bands are like families so even though you may not agree all the time you still uh, still love each other right yeah, from the video we saw, it looks like you had a horrible time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yet it was, there were smiles all around. And, and, you know, the weird thing is uh, we did our set, and I, I have a tendency to be, you know, maybe overly uh, detail-oriented, but I started the conversation with Ace's people three weeks ago as to, listen, are we going to play? Are we going to get up and do a couple songs? And I didn't find out until five minutes before Ace went on stage if we were playing and what the songs he wanted to play were. So wow. we didn't get a chance to do a sound show. We just jumped up there, and it was all uh, it all came back. It was like riding a bike. After 30 years, like, the songs came right back. Wow. wow. That is pretty awesome. And yeah. on a side yeah, it was, note. It was cool. Yeah, on a side note, I would like to uh, give Ace a shout-out for his indirect – ability to get you on our show because i posted that video of you guys doing rock soldiers 
on my Facebook page and made the comment of it took almost 30 years, but it was worth the wait. And then um, I tagged you and Todd on the show or on the video. And then Bill asked you to come on the show, and here we are today. Well, I'm I'm happy to be here. You know, that you guys you guys have been the supporters for all these years, and I've said it hundreds of times over the last four decades. If it wasn't for people like you guys and girls that that, that want to listen and have remained, you know, true supporters and friends, we wouldn't have the luxury of doing what we love to do for a living. You know, if we're all connected here and you know everybody your part is just as important as our part and i always believe that and i will till the day i die wow john i got a question for i got a question for you because it's been kind of bugging me as far as you know you've been a friend of ace and played with ace for for many many years now how did you come to to know him because you were i mean you had played for uh, you know, David, you know, other bands and, 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 and people, how did you meet Ace? How did that come about? Well, the, come about? the um, I, I had uh, gotten a, my first big break actually was uh, a gig with Peter Frampton in 1979 right. when he was still like at the peak of the Frampton Comes Alive mania. It was still going full, uh, full effect. So, um, what happened was I had a club band up here. I, I live about 60 miles north of Manhattan, and it was a you know good band. But I realized that no one was going to come up here and find me. So um, one of my dearest friends, still to this day, we uh, I've known him since 1971, Crazy Joe Rinda. He uh, he was partners in the studio with Chip Taylor. Now Chip Taylor, uh, you would know from the Ace Connection. Uh, co-writer of Rock Soldiers, but mm -hmm. Chip wrote Angel of the Morning. He wrote Wild Thing. You know, uh, very prolific songwriter in the '60s, '70s. And mm -hmm. the first album I played on was uh, an, an album by Chip, and and Joe Renda was uh, the musical director. So Joe and I became uh, lifelong friends. Uh, he opened up a studio around 1978 with Chip. And Chip's brother is John Voigt, the actor. So they were partners in that. Hmm. And uh, I said, I reached out to him. I said, listen, I, I would like to come down and record. I'll play for free. I just need as much experience as possible uh, in the studio. It's kind of like any of you guys golf. When you first started, like the first tee jitters type thing, mm -hmm. you, sure. you get up there and you, 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 well, I wanted to get that out of the way in the recording studio because, you know, when the red light goes on and, and the, uh, the producer goes, okay, we're recording. It's like, okay, time to choke. <laughs> yeah. So um, I reached out to Joe and I started going down there, um, even though I'd, I'd play clubs where you get done at three in the morning. If he had a session for me at 10 o'clock, I'd get in the car and drive an hour south and I would work in his studio. And um, that's actually how I got the gig with Frampton. Uh, mm. Bobby Mayo, the late, amazing Bobby Mayo, uh, was touring with Peter and they were in the middle of the tour. They took a break. The bass player wasn't working that he had and uh, they needed a bass player. So I got a call on a Tuesday and on Friday night I was on stage playing, you know, big arenas, which was pretty amazing for a little chubby kid from upstate New York. <laughs> so, fast so, so, a few so, years. so, so you were a bass player with a car and, 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 uh, and, yes, to do exactly. <laughs> yeah. Not, One of the not, not, not against the bass players, but you know the, the old joke. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, gotcha. Um, so anyway, what what happened there was uh, I had toured with Peter for probably about three or four years, and then Peter said I need to take a break. So around about 1983, I was at North Lake Sound Studio, which was Joe Renda's studio, and I, I walked in one day, and Ace Frehley had. Uh, done some of the recording for his solo album uh, when they when he was in Kiss when he did New York Groove and all that stuff at the studio as well and he was friends with Joe so I showed up one day and uh, I if I remember correctly uh, I walked in and went up into the, the lounge area and there was a, a body on the floor and uh, I said who's that guy and Joe said that's Ace Frehley from Kiss I, said, well, I hope he wakes up I'm like seriously so I just kind of stepped over and went into the kitchen and made myself a sandwich. Eventually, he, he uh, woke up or whatever whatever happened to him, and we started chatting. 
and we just he would he had left Kiss. Uh, I wasn't working with Peter, and we just started talking about, you know, what we what made us want to be musicians, and and none of that was thinking that you were going to be famous or make a lot of money. We just started playing as we loved to play. So he goes, well, why don't you come to my studio in Connecticut? I'll invite Anton Fig up, and we'll just start jamming. And that's how our relationship started. I went out to his studio, and we just we started we we became a, a garage band again, like we did when we were kids. We did wow. Zeppelin songs, Hendrix songs, that's cool. and then we we enjoyed work. The three of us enjoyed playing with each other and hanging out. And that's when the first seeds of Fraley's Comet were born. Hmm. Or planted, actually. <laughs> wow. How many people get to say they were in a garage band with Ace Fraley? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Not very well, many, because he, he wasn't in know, a very many we garage all started bands. That. <laughs> yeah, we all started that way. I mean, the Beatles started that way. Everybody did. No, that was, like I said, that was an interesting, because I was wanting to ask you about that, because, you know, I've spent the last week or so, and I was kind of, you know, going through all the different, through the internet of the connections of whatever, and I was like, going, I can't find a connection where you you know came into because you know his solo album had Anton Fig which you know Anton's been with yep. him for a lot of times and then what Will Lee and then Ace played most of the bass on his solo album exactly yeah mm-hmm. so that's why well, I was that trying was to what? Figure... Was, that, was that like seventy eight what what year did they do that it was seven well it been seventy it was released yeah. in seven right so it had been seventy seven yeah. probably yeah yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the timing was just right. I, I wasn't, I wasn't in a band, and Ace wasn't in a band, and uh, and uh, it, it was just, it was great. I mean, we 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 got together to play for all the right reasons, and none of them were business. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That is awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Bill, Bill. Oh, uh, well, you know, sticking in, you know, staying with that same theme. So, um. When the when you guys started writing, did Ace do most of the writing? Was it pretty much all of you guys writing together? I mean, that's what it, it looks like. It was you guys writing together. So was it? Is that pretty much how? Yeah, it was? Well, I, I always yeah I always uh, I started off and uh, I, I brought him. I was I just picked up an eight string bass one day and I started playing it and I started plunking around on what ended up being Fracture Two. I have to say I was ignorant. I didn't never heard the first frac. I never heard fractured mirror. Never, n- never heard it at all. But as I was playing this on the eight string, they said, ah, eh, sounds like fractured mirror. Eh? <laughs> on that. So, uh, in his inimitable fashion. And, um, you know, we, yeah, we wrote together, uh, you know, songs like breakout, uh, when we, you know, when we were looking at trying to get a record deal, uh, Ace had a studio to, in the basement of his house. He had a fantastic studio, and you know, just he had a lot of tapes up on shelves. And and this one tape box caught my eye, and it said Car Jam. And I said, "What is that?" And he said, "Ah, something Eric Car Jam." So I said, "What? Well, can I hear it?" And um, we put it on the tape machine, and I just hear this amazing groove, and that became Breakout. Uh, basically, you know, that, so a, a lot of the writing came from different areas. Ace reached out to uh, other people that he knew that were, were, were writing songs. And then, you know, he came up with stuff like uh, dolls, but yeah, keep in mind the first version of the band, uh, there was songs like audio video and uh, the Fraley's Comet album only probably had a couple of the songs that the first incarnation of Fraley's Comet had. Right. Uh, And Mm. that was with Richie Scarlett and a keyboard player by the name of Arthur Stead. Right. And then they brought Uh, Todd in to replace those guys. Well, yeah, what happened was we, with that particular, with that five piece band, uh, and I met Arthur because Arthur was playing keyboards with Peter Frampton with me for a while. So when we started putting that first band together, you know, it was just, uh, Ace, Anton, and myself, we said, well, let's let's get a keyboard player and uh, another guitar player. So that's when Richie Scarlett and Arthur Slade came in, and we did a bunch of demos, and we did get a record deal with a label in England, with name escapes me, but we were getting ready to record the album, and the label went bankrupt. And wow. after putting like a, you know, a good solid year into preparing, 
that kind of threw everybody for a loop. And it's like, man, we're back to square one. And at that point, uh, you know, everybody had a lot of us had young children and we had to work. So, uh, Anton and I went off and joined scandal for a tour of Japan. And I don't know if you remember that band, Patty. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. I was going to ask you about that here in a little bit, but we'll, 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 we'll get to yeah, it. Well, <laughs> you know, so, so that basically, uh, it brought everything to a grinding halt and, and we went off and did different things. So Richie went and did his solo work. Uh, Arthur, I think, ended up working with Public Image Limited and uh, then Anton and I did Scandal and then from that I ended up jumping into John Waits' band, which is where I actually met Todd Howarth because uh, we did a co-headline tour one year with Cheap Trick and John Waite and yeah. Todd was uh, playing keyboards at Cheap yeah. Trick and we became great friends from that point forward. Awesome. Cool. I was say you, you and you and Todd have had a relationship probably lasting longer than. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. You've done today, it, you, know, you seem like you do a lot of things together. This, just getting back to the yeah, scandal great. real quick. I'm mean, sorry, just with the scandal real quick. Now, was that when you when it was uh, Patty Smite by herself, or was that still Patty Smite? No, it's still scandal. Games? Scandal. Oh, it was still it was scandal. scandal. Yeah, cool. some. Yeah, some. I don't know how it was billed, but uh, it was always scandal. I think it went like scandal, and then it was like, scandal featuring, and then it was then they they kind of dropped the the scandal went with Patty Smite. You know, I was curious whenever yeah, that was. Yeah, this but, was uh, this was right not too long after the Warrior was a big hit. So cool. And okay. and all we did we did a, we did a tour of Japan, and okay. uh, while we were touring Japan, John Waite was touring Japan. And right. Frankie LaRocca was playing drums with him, and we became friends. And then Wait needed a bass player. You know that that back in the '80s, that, it was an unbelievably fertile time in New York uh, for music. And it was like a it was it was a lot smaller uh, business than it is now. Uh, in as much as you could go to uh, SIR rehearsal studios and walk in and just. Hey, Ray, what are you doing? We need somebody to, you know, to play on this record or to do this tour. There was a lot of uh, camaraderie. There's a lot of people helping each other. You know, sadly, that's completely gone now. Uh, there's very little music scene in New York other than like urban stuff or rap. But uh, for about, I want to say for about 15 years, it was really going strong, and it was a great time to be uh, to be a young musician and coming up. So a lot of great friends. Exactly. So, what what's the music scene up in that area like now? Is that is it is it not that way because people are recording at home and in you know all that stuff going on now, or is it just what what's causing it to be well, so different? I, you know, the the business when, once we got into the '90s and and then grunge came in and record labels realized, hey, we can we can get this band to make a record for ten thousand bucks and. I remember the last big album that uh, one of the last big albums I played on was uh, David Lee Roth's Your Filthy Little Mouth. The budget on that by the time he was done was $800,000. Wow. That's what he spent yeah. to make that record. But, you know, that, that, that's gone. Uh, but also yeah. what happened was the business... It, it, more people got into it more, you know, then technology came around and you could start, you know, making your own record and the grunge thing It, you know, we used to strive for sonic perfection and, you know, all kinds of, you know, we, we labored over making the record sound as great as possible. And then this, the grunge thing came along, which had its merits because it was, you know, earthy and, it got, you know, it, things got a, started getting a little overproduced, uh, in the late eighties and nineties with all the synthesizers and 8 million tracks and uh, Nirvana and bands like that brought it right back to the garage basically. Right. Uh, but then also what happened was y you had DJs coming in and they mm -hmm. ended up, you know, club owners in their uh, greedy fashion mm -hmm. said, wait a minute, why, why should we pay a band 400 bucks? We can get a DJ for 150. Right. Uh, and then what happened there was clubs started closing and that was, that's where we learned how to play. There's no better place to learn how to play than uh, in front of a live audience. But now they stopped hiring, you know, bands. They brought DJs right. in 
And then the drinking age got raised to 21 in, in most states. And that really uh, took a toll. So it, it was like a perfect storm of everything working against uh, that that training ground that we used to have coming up in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Well, yeah, and like I said, I'm I you know I I'm I actually have a you know I, I'm I work at Toyota I'm a, I'm a I have a, I have a job, but on weekends I do play music, and you know I'm playing music for the last thirty years. I made four hundred bucks a night, you know, for the whole band back in nineteen eighty three. Yeah. You know what I make yep. now? I make four hundred bucks a night. I know what you're say. <laughs> exactly. And you, I mean, no, everything well, else has went up, I had a and I tell you what, my cost yeah. of my equipment has not went down. But you know what? I make the same amount of money I made thirty years ago playing music in a bar. And that that is that is absolutely. <laughs> and I do it because I love it. The saddest so, thing. Exactly. Yeah, I hear but, you. But that's but, what happened. Uh, we, we used to make I, before I got in Frappa's band I did all the business for the, the club band I had right. we made a hundred bucks a man a night in 1976 you could and that's buy what a it house is right now it's family. like everybody is like trying to make a hundred bucks a night that's what you try to do yep. and it's sad I mean to... yeah <laughs> well you know what we also we were getting paid cash back then now you get 10.99 in a lot of these clubs so you got to I mean, pay taxes I, I on the hundred. Get, I still get cash most places I play. <laughs> okay. Did you oh, hear oh, that IRS? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm burnt. <laughs> That's it. No. Oh I no! When I look when I look back on my uh, when I look back at my like social security for those years, you know, it's like <laughs> wow, I made that little money and survived. But, but you're absolutely right. I I really feel sorry for musicians that, that want to get out and play because it's. Uh, the thing is, it's hard is, to do right person now. Person that's got, say, you got you wrote some songs and they're really great, and it could be the next big hit, but they can't get even a company to even look at them. But then they got this, what this girl like, Catch Me Outside. This girl who's on like whatever Doctor Phil, whatever Atlantic. Oh Breaker, yeah, I heard like, about that. like a million dollar contract and all this bullshit. This sing this song where it's basically auto tune, and but they know that they're going to sell a shitload because she's got. A million followers, basically on Facebook. You know that's bullshit. Right. Well, yeah. It's bullshit. That's that's what uh, I re I remember when American Idol first came on. I didn't watch it, but a friend of mine who was in the business said, "You know, you really you really need to watch this, but not to really listen to who's on it, but just see what is going to happen right. with this." And what you did is you basically took a bunch of kids who in a million years probably would have never gotten an opportunity to do anything. And right. now you put them in front of, I don't know, X number of million people a week. And on top of it, you have people voting for them. So you already have a barometer of who's going to sell records. Right. And that's, that's it. That was what it became. It became like a, a giant, uh, you know, County fair talent uh, contest. Right. But the brilliance of it was, you knew that you, the hardest thing to do to break an artist is to get anybody to know who the hell you even are. Right. Well, here they are. They, they come into your living room once a week. So. Well, it, was and brilliant. The, it was a brilliant move. And the best thing for that thing, though, was to not win the competition because winning it meant yep. you were under contract with a really shitty contract. And, you know, like people like Dor or, you know, the people who didn't win, they they made it big without that, you know. Because they had the notoriety, yeah. you know. Yeah, I got to tell you really quick, uh, my um, you know six degrees of separation with uh, American Idol. Uh, remember Ruben Stoddard, big mm -hmm. guy? Mm -hmm. Yep. He was on, and and then there was another guy with gray hair that played a harmonica. Yeah, uh, uh, Hick, Hick, Hicks, Jason Hicks. Taylor Hicks, yeah, yeah. Taylor Hicks, okay, yeah. Okay, so yeah, right, right around that era. Uh, I think Ruben was the year before and then Taylor was the year after. So anyway, cut to the chase. I, I, I have to fly out to, um, to LA to do, uh, it was a big event for universal records. So it was with Frampton, but you know, this went on for like a, a week. So every, every night there were different artists coming and playing at these big soirees and blah, blah, blah. So I get to the airport you know, I'm just, I'm only going to be there for like 48 hours. So I got my little carry on bag, roll, rolling thing. And, uh, I, I want to say this 
lady in maybe her 50s worked for the limo company that was picking me up. And uh, she met me inside the terminal at LA, LAX, and uh, she says, oh, I, let me take your bag. I said, no, that's okay. I can, you know, don't don't mind me, ma'am. I'll, I'll care. No, no, I have to take your bag. Said, okay, take my bag. So there I am walking behind this 50-year-old lady, and she's carrying my luggage. That feel like an idiot. So then I get in the car, and she she looks in the back the rear room here. She goes, is it okay if I speak directly to you? And now I'm going, all right, well, this must be candid camera. What, what, I'm being set up <laughs> by somebody here. I said, of course you can speak. I, I said, why would you even say something like that? She goes, oh, well, my last two pickups, I got in a lot of trouble. I said, what, what do you mean? She goes, well, this guy, this guy, Ruben, I picked him up and, and I, you know, I, I said, hello, how are you? And he yelled at me and said, you can't speak directly to me. Speak to my, my man here. And so I, said, I, said, I said, wow. And she goes, yeah, and this other guy, Taylor, uh, Taylor Hicks from American Idol, he had like 20 bags, in, and I had to carry them all by myself because he doesn't carry his own suitcases. Oh, and geez. that just blew my mind. He does again, now. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Because he's no, got no, you, no. I mean, yeah, but that's – that's what you were dealing with. These people, don't get me wrong, I thought I think they were both talented, but they didn't deserve to be there. They didn't pay any dues. Yeah. Taylor Hicks is playing at Joe's Bar for 400 bucks this weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I think I saw him in LAX picking up people's bags. <laughs> he's working at the airport. He's, he's probably making a fortune. Those guys, those skycaps make a lot of money. <laughs> they do. You know, it is funny though about that show. You know, I, I, I agree. It definitely gave ex- people exposure that wouldn't wouldn't have never gotten exposure before. But if you look at the longevity of anybody on that show, there are very, very, very few people that made it yeah i mean that, that have really have sustained it i guess you know carrie underwood yeah billy clarkson to it you know um chris and dodger then, who uh, did, who the, didn't win and yes. has done really well. yeah um but really the rest of them just they're they're not there i mean they just they have a record or two and then they fall off the planet and um yeah i i expected it to last a little longer than that and the other thing about that you know talking about that and, and i don't want to spend much time on this but you know the other show the voice I find that interesting because I don't know that I've ever, I don't, I don't remember if I've ever heard an artist from that show with a single. Yeah, you're I, right. I don't think yeah. I have. I mean, I, there may have been, but I don't think I have, which I thought that was the purpose, which was weird. Yeah. Yeah. The one guy, yeah, we, we won- had a little, we had a little summer cottage that, uh, on a lake and, you know, they used to have, it, it's, it's only open from like May to October. So then, like during the summer season, there would be like entertain like there one night they'd have bingo and then they'd have like a baking contest and then another it was somebody who won the voice. <laughs> it's like, what is this guy doing here playing with like thirty people at a, at a at a summer cottage lake house? Yeah, but that's that's, that's what happens yeah. to a lot of them. I think a guy that was either I thought he won the voice a couple of years ago um, was from the Indianapolis area and he sang the national anthem and a little gig thing in the middle of uh, my son's college football game yeah at half, which i was yeah. like what the hell he's should be out somewhere doing something but yeah it's kind of uh, weird it's tough kind of weird kind well, of but, like, you know most of them are that songwriters so yeah you know what what is I mean, yeah they they can they can sing or they can whatever but there's no again it, there, there were not a lot of dues paid yeah on a lot of them uh, yeah, so the, so then they don't know what to do, they don't know what to do with the fame right, and, exactly. the, and the and the and all that because they don't have anybody. Well, they do what what they were talking about, right? I can't carry my own bags. Yeah. I'm supposed to act like this. I'm supposed to be whatever, and and they yeah. lose that humanness, and then they lose their career because nobody's going to tolerate that. Yep. crap. So, but you know, the music business has always been like you know, chew them up and spit them out. That's it's yeah. that's just kind of the nature of the game, sadly. Yeah. So we've had a question. Yeah, that's here. why you, you, you have to give, you have to give Kiss a, a lot of credit. But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give them credit, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take some of it away from them because I, I've experienced it through my connection with the Kiss family through Fraley's Comet. But I'm telling you, if that band did not have the Kiss Army and and the the they, the Kiss I hate to use the word fans but that, for lack of uh, 
the Kiss fans are the most dedicated fans on the face of the earth. That band would have been long gone if it wasn't for the Kiss Army and the Kiss fans. Uh, I firmly believe that. And I, I've, been, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of playing with a lot of big artists, and none of them that I've ever toured with or recorded with or worked with have a fan base that, that are that dedicated and just they're the best the best I've ever met the best bunch of friends uh, and fans I've ever met are, are the Kiss fans and they're very opinionated too thank you I'll say, I'll, I'll say thank you <laughs> and we follow that's okay you, you, I mean we, we fall on either side of the you know the spectrum depending on what the topic is and what stupid yeah. things somebody said <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or what they're doing. It, it's funny you say that, John, because um, I met Bruce Kulick one time, and it was uh, a really kind of an odd thing. We we had a event here where we have an outdoor um, event. It had stormed. It was when he was playing for with Grand Funk just a couple of years ago, and we actually mm-hmm. were out in the storm. And the sheriff came and said, "There's a tornado coming. You need to come with me." And took us under the stage because it was an amphitheater. And they walked in, and I'm soaking wet and I'm with some other people and I've got my kiss t-shirt on and walk right in Bu- Bruce Kulik standing there and goes I should have known it was one of you people <laughs> <laughs> he said there's one of he's you he's a great in every guy we crowd. just toured Australia with him yeah so, right exactly yeah. he goes there's one of you in every crowd and y'all are nuts because I don't know what the hell's wrong with you <laughs> I said well I got a backpack of stuff <laughs> I need you to sign Bruce <laughs> yeah. well, while, while he's we're... a great guy yeah while while we're talking about uh, Kiss and Kiss fans, I have just a couple of quick questions for you, John. Uh, I know uh, Eric co-wrote Breakout. Did you ever get the opportunity to work with him when they did that song, or by the time you got there, was the song already pretty well done? Because we all know that Gene and Paul would not let Eric record with Ace on that song. Yeah, we wanted him to. Uh, well, actually, no. Uh, because I co-produced all the records. Uh, Anton was a drummer for that, uh, and and there was never any any idea. We basically, when I pulled that tape off the shelf and put it on, it was you know, and the beat, and it, but that's all it was. There, it didn't go too much farther past that. Then Richie Scarlett wrote the lyrics to it, uh, and then Ace put you know some extra music to it, and. We, you know, we recorded it uh, with the band. Uh, it, there was never talk of Eric doing it. However, there was one point when Anton, you know, was our drummer, and then he got the gig with Letterman, which is, you know, mm-hmm. the, one of the best gigs you could possibly get in the music business. Uh, so he couldn't tour with us anymore. And before we got, I think it was before we got Sandy Slavin, and the band near the uh, the trouble walking era, um, we would jam with uh, with Eric at, at SIR in New York, and uh, I know Gene wasn't too happy about that. Uh, and you know, at that point, we would have had him come and uh, play on the record, but I guess he got uh, he got slapped on the wrist and said, you know, you're not going to be doing that. So, but I did get the. I mean, we we played together a few times, and you know, it was just it was phenomenal. It was a bass players dream to play with him. That's pretty awesome to hear. Now, my yeah. my, my second thing about uh, Kiss fan, well, not Kiss fans, Kiss themselves. I know you guys were on tour back in the '80s, and somehow Gene and Paul ended up on stage, and somebody would not let Gene have a bass guitar. Would he like to tell that story? Of course, I'd, I'd be happy to tell it. Um, <laughs> here's what happened with that. Uh, again, SIR on 52nd Street and 8th Avenue in Manhattan was the rehearsal studio in New York City at the time. Not there anymore. I think it's probably luxury condos, but that it was a historical building. I mean, that, that everybody rehearsed there. There were three rooms there: two smaller ones and a sound stage, which was basically for full production for sound and lights when you're get you're just getting ready to hit the road. The other rooms were like if you're getting, putting your album together, you go in and you rehearse the songs. They were still good sized rooms, but they weren't the big room. So we had just finished, uh, I think it was Second Sighting. And uh, we were rehearsing in the big room at SIR. Now, I lived a little bit 
north of the city. So when we were rehearsing, I'd stay in town from Monday through Friday, and I'd come home and be with my family on the weekends. But, you know, because when we get done rehearsing, I I didn't feel like just going back and sitting in my hotel room. So I'd always hang out at SRN and help all the guys who work there clean up, you know, sweep up, just get the place ready for the next day. And uh, so we became really close. Uh, uh, those guys are, were phenomenal for me. And I remember being home one weekend and the phone rings and one of my buddies from SIR and he just, he, I answered the phone, I said, hello. And he goes, just say no. And I said, <laughs> I, I said, what is he? He goes, just say no. I said, okay, no. Now what's this about? He goes, that's all I wanted to hear. He said, yeah, uh, Gene Simmons found out that you guys were rehearsing in the big room and they need to rehearse. And he called up the owner, Michael Johnson, and told him to throw us out of the room. And Michael Johnson said, well, you know, you call John up and, you know, what if he says, okay, okay. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, what gives this guy the right to do that? And I said, absolutely not. Forget it. So uh, I get into the city the next day, <clears throat> and I said to Ace, I told him the story. I said, you know, we're getting ready to, to, to launch this tour at the limelight in New York City. I said, Gene and Paul are going to be in one of these other rooms in the next day or two. I said, uh, why don't you ask them? I, I was just trying to get more uh, publicity for our record, to be honest. And uh, I said, why don't you ask them uh, to stop by? He goes, ah, I feel uncomfortable <laughs> doing that. I said, ah, all right, whatever. So we're rehearsing, and uh, we're well, you playing, love and the door pops open, and his head pops in. And it's Gene. And he's like, oh, who's in here? And I'm thinking, yeah, he's so full of shit. It's unbelievable. You know who's in, <laughs> who's in here. You tried to get us thrown out. So, And you know what? I'm not a vindictive person, but I'm sorry. That, that got my Sicilian up. And it's like, but, you know, don't try to pull that power play. It's just not the right thing to do as a human being. And uh, so anyway, long, real long story short, Ace asked him to come by. And uh, we did our show at the limelight and like near the end of the show, all of a sudden you, it had a big balcony and uh, it kind of surrounded the whole building because it was an old church. And uh, you could all of a sudden see people buzzing on uh, Gene and Paul and then they came down. Um, we came on for our encore and uh, we had a guitar for Paul and Gene walked up to me and I said, this is my band. I play bass. There's the microphone. And that was the, that's the whole story. <laughs> and you know what? I would not have done that. I, w I would have gladly given him the bass if he didn't try to pull what he tried to pull. Yeah. Good for you. Got, you know what? Good exactly. for you. Good for you. He, he, does, but, he got what he deserved, to be honest. Well, you yeah. just don't. It's not. You don't do that. You know. That's disrespectful you, you to you. It because just, people you know. let you. Yeah, exactly. 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 You know, people let, let him get away. And I have to say. The few times I ran into him after that, it was very nice to me. So, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, sometimes even the even people on top have to be put in their place. I mean, because they just they don't if if they disrespect you, you know, disrespectful, is disrespectful. It doesn't matter what where it comes from. Yeah. Period. Absolutely. That, that is that is a great I story, know. and I've heard it before, but I just wanted. <laughs> I wanted our audience to be able to hear that because I just you wanted I, to hear I could not hear that story the enough. Ass. I mean, the horse's mouth. <laughs> All right, I think Bill's got yep. a question. Yeah, for you. you know what? If you know, part of me, part of me is, you know, I probably should have let him, maybe, but but at the time, it really bothered me. It bothered me that he thought he was that. Um, I don't know. Powerful and attractive. Yeah. That entitled. Yeah, yeah. just. Exactly. I'm sorry. It just doesn't the world. And my for, world doesn't and for operate somebody that. that like him now. He, I, I think, in the last month he's pulled up this millennial thing. You've noticed that everything he says now. You millennials don't know what you don't know what respect is. You millennials don't. So <laughs> for a guy who says yeah. that, he should have learned that shit a long time ago. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well. You know, part of my yeah, part of my yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But hey, you know what? Everybody's different, and. um uh, I, you know, kudos to him for he's still out there doing it. Um, doing a good job. You know, I, I think you can you can operate uh, at a level where you don't offend people or hurt people. But 
you know, whatever floats your boat. Uh, I, I would, I, you know, I'm never going to be a, a, as famous as he is. I've never wanted to be that, to be honest with you. I've, I've been very happy to be a, a, a side man and a supporter. And whenever I'm hired and whatever band it was, my job is to serve the song and the artist. That's the, uh, that's where I get my joy out of. There you go. Did you, did you see the video of him and Ace from this past weekend? I did. Yeah, they did Parasite, right? Yeah, they they did three they did songs. Parasite did and Cold Shock Gin. Me and Cold Gin and Rock and Roll All Night. Yeah. Oh, cool. I, yeah. yeah, I saw Parasite. I see the other two. Yeah, it was yeah, pretty cool. It was great. I mean, yeah. Yeah. They were raising money and, uh, yep. you know, you, you know I, I, I don't really follow the kiss thing that much but i i understand they do a lot of stuff for vets and you know good for them yeah they, they should yeah all right so let's get back to your band so let's talk a little bit about four by fate so the album came out in 2016 and yeah, um you guys have been yeah been out supporting that so um writing new stuff for a new album yet or still working on this one absolutely we're absolutely writing as a matter of fact uh, right before you you guys rang me up i was with pat gasparini uh he lives uh, he's a neighbor pretty pretty close to me and he's got a great recording studio up here and uh he's a songwriting machine I and mean, he's got amazing stuff he and i are working with this uh, young lady by the name of rachel lauren l-o-r-i-n who you're going to hear a lot about but uh cool we got a lot of new material ready and uh actually we recorded uh, a live set at the chance where we play with Ace, but we rec- we uh, recorded this, I think, six months prior when we headlined there. And I just started listening to some of the tracks tonight. And, man, I have to say, the band was firing on all cylinders. And uh, I think we got, if we wanted to put out uh, a live album or some great live tracks, uh, I just heard them this afternoon. And I think we're going to look into that a little bit, too. So. But that hopefully we'll get new music out sooner than later. Uh, but honestly, we haven't really, uh, through a whole series of, of business snafu stuff, uh, which I really won't get into, but we wow. haven't really had the opportunity to tour uh, our album Relentless. Uh, right. We've only done, in the States, we've only played as a band, I think, five times. Wow. Um, yeah, because you were going serious? to Europe, right? You went to Europe and, and Australia, right? Well, we, we did um, the Alcatraz Festival, but it was with the two original guys uh, and uh, okay. it started right. Four by Fate. Uh, so we had Stet Howland and Sean Kelly in the band. We played the Alcatraz Festival. So that was our one time over in Europe. And then uh, not too long ago, maybe five, six months ago, we did a, a two-week run with Bruce Kulick and a, a group called Sisters Doll from Australia who are amazing the, and, and they were uh, they were also Peter Chris's backup band on his two farewell shows one he did in uh, Australia and Melbourne and then the one he did in New York City they flew the band uh, there's three brothers in the band and, and they're just they're phenomenal and they were Peter's backup band and what Bruce's you- backup band interesting right. A friend of ours, uh, another podcaster, I'm, I'm sure you know Mitch Lafon. He he yeah, told me Mitch. about this album. He Mitch get this Mitch got this album from Todd earlier on, even before it was released. And I he had mentioned the fact of you know that that, that you guys did redid. Uh, it's over now, and I'm like, on how yeah. does it sound? And he's like, on it sounds greater than ever. And I'm like, on that was my actually that's my favorite Fraley's Comet song ever. I mean, that, that's a song there wow. to me was. And Todd was um, Todd was a great. I mean, Ace played a great guitar, but Todd was a great singer. And that whole song, Ace didn't, play, Ace didn't even play on that on the record. Oh, really? <laughs> that 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 is Todd, myself, and Jamie Oldacre. Wow. The first time Todd played that for me, it blew me away. I said, and and That's he played it for me when we. Yeah, thank you. I I agree. It that one and Breakout are. Yeah. Are, are my are my two favorites, but yeah, um, those are great. Songs. When he played it for me, uh, it's just we, we got to record this somehow. Oh, and it, he had written it for he had written it for Cheap Trick, and they passed really? on it. I said, "Well, I'm not passing <laughs> on. It. I want to record it." And, Too you bad know, for them. The second, <laughs> writing, 
yeah, second sighting didn't, you know, didn't get that much exposure either. So uh, I said, you know, I, I, I pleaded with him. Uh, didn't take a lot of pleading, but <laughs> I said, can we just recut the song again? And I just heard it, the live version that I was telling you about this recording we did a few months mm-hmm. back. And it is absolutely I think this live version might be my favorite of all of them. I gotta hear it. I got. I hope. Hopefully, that'll go out because I. I love to hear that. That would be just awesome. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Robbie but... Fuso, or, you know, our drummer from Skid Row fame, played the daylights out of it. And uh, there's something. There's something about you know. I I, I toured with the preeminent uh, live musician, uh, you know, Frampton. And there's something that happens when you play a band plays live that that is hard to capture in the studio. Exactly. Well, it's, I always I always hear people talk about it being organic because you're there's you're feeding off the crowd. There's yes, it yeah. is what it is. You know, you can't fix yeah. it, and and sometimes that makes for some incredible moments. That's for sure. But but yeah. like I said. I, yeah. See, so, you know, you 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 see, see four by Fate's re, you know album Relentless was just, I mean, that had some songs that weren't they didn't sound old. I mean, here you are, a, a, you know, guys that have been around forever, but it was fresh. It sounded really oh, fresh. Thank you. I and thank that's why I like that even along. and even the even the fact of you know that you covered a song and you covered you know actually cover you know you know see, see rock and roll hoochie and an older yeah, song. Yeah, I really want to do that. But know? still, it yeah. sounds fresh. It sounds really good. Well, thank you. Well, and so, you know what? Let's, let's um, we got to give credit where credit is due to a wonderful, dear uh, human being, an amazing drummer, late A.J. Parrow. I mean, he, he came in and bailed us out. I don't know if you know what happened with that whole thing, but Stet Howland was our drummer, and uh, we... We're at Todd and I were at a Kiss convention and it was a, a Saturday, and we were getting ready to go into the studio like on Tuesday, and uh, Todd was flown in from California. The studio was booked, paid for, everything was done, and we're at the Kiss convention in New Jersey. And uh, a friend of ours, Sue Newman, came up, and she goes, "Look at this post on Facebook. It's Stet in the hospital." I say, like, "What?" <laughs> so. The day before he was getting ready to fly up to come up to record the album, he gets in this really bad car crash. But now we, we got to record because Todd's here, and we're paying for this record ourselves. So I was like, all right, now we're like 10 grand in the hole. We got to record on Tuesday. So we ended up, it was suggested that we try A.J. Perrell, and I didn't know anything about him except, you know, the Twisted Sister stuff. And, I, you know, I can't, I, you have to be honest, I, I, maybe not the biggest fan of that stuff, but um, I said, oh, man. I said, well, before I commit, let me let me go to YouTube, and that's the beauty of the, you know, the Internet nowadays. So uh, AJ had just done one of these, you know, these things called a Bonzo Bash, where all these exactly. drummers get together. And, right. Yeah, and, and, and I, it, the first video that came up was AJ playing at a Bonzo Bash like a week bef- uh, before, and it was like, holy, this guy can play, seriously play. So we called him up, and um, Todd sent him the six songs, uh, you know, over the Internet. And he literally had 24 hours to, to just listen to them. Uh-huh. And uh, so Todd and I are in the studio, and we get this call from AJ. He goes, you're not going to believe it. I just left my house in New Jersey to drive up. I just got in a car accident. I said, no, nah, this can't be act- This can't be happening. So, fortunately, though, <laughs> his car was damaged, but he wasn't in the hospital because that got really banged up. You know, he was in a neck brace and a whole bit. Oh so, my! Wow! Wow! Uh, so we we sent we sent a car for him, a limo, and he got there a few hours late, and we recorded the first half of Relentless with AJ, and wow. then sadly we know what happened. You know, he yeah. passed. He was going to be in the band. I, I mean, he he asked us. He goes. I'm, I'm loving this. He goes, you guys really need a drummer? I said, well, we have no idea how, if Stet's completely out of commitment. So um, right. he was going to be our drummer. And wow. then he met an un- untimely uh, death. So. Yeah. yeah. So sad. And then Rob stepped in and um, and finished the record off in, in, in good style. And uh, that's 
that's the band that we have now. Pat Gasparini, Rob Afuso, uh, Todd Howard, and myself. Awesome. So, so are we going to see you in the you know in the U.S. touring? I mean, is that going to happen, or is that still something still being worked out? Well, I'm in witness protection, so you, you won't see me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, a, a reasonable sex or not? A, well, we're working on it now. Uh, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah, Frank Zappa's doing that. I heard. Yeah, you know, oh, next yeah. year. Whatever. I, I don't know how, but it'll be interesting to see. Um, we're working on it. I mean, it is so hard right now, for some reason, to get booking agents. Um, you know, and we're willing to get out there and put on a great show. The the, the beauty of the, of this band, the thing that I like, and it's what I liked about working with Peter Frampton for three decades. A Peter Frampton show ran the gamut from Humble Pie to Sign Seal Delivered to Baby I Love Your Way to Lines on My Face to Do You Feel Like We Do. It was every style of music in one evening. And I really like that. I love that. And with four by fate obviously you know it's a heavier uh approach but we do like what i would like to call a heritage section of the show where you know we'll do a cheap trick number we'll do a skid row number we'll do a humble pie number uh, we'll do a, a bank uh that pat gasparini had called pound that was pretty big in the 90s so uh, we're playing our own music we're playing uh, some the Fraley's Comet tunes that Todd wrote and sang, and right. then we're doing music from uh, the rest of our career. So it really it's a fun night for us, and it's a fun night for the people in the audience. I think because it's it's kind of like um, getting a, a little bit of uh, rock music history in one evening. Well, probably, and if a person didn't ha- hadn't seen your show or looked it up on the internet. You know, they would come in and, and see this show and go, oh, my gosh, they're playing this, and oh, they're playing this, and it's kind of a surprise, you know. I try to not go to the Internet before a concert and look up the previous night, and, you know, I try to. You're so full of crap. I know, yeah. but it's hard <laughs> not to. You out. It's hard You're not so to. You're so full of crap. <laughs> it's That's hard such not a to. Lot. John, well, don't... I gotta schedule. I gotta schedule my piss break. You know, I gotta go to the pee at some point. So where where am I gonna go pee at? So... <laughs> All right, boy, stop fighting. Don't make me stop this car. <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, nah, I, 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 we're looking forward to getting out there. We'll get out there when we're we're able to afford to get out there. It, it's as simple right. as that. And no one is looking for, you know, an inordinate amount of money. We just want to get out and play, but. Right. You know, bringing Todd in and then uh, touring is not a, a, a inexpensive uh, proposal, right. uh, even if you're doing it on a shoestring budget. And uh, it's not it's expensive to put everybody up in hotels and crew and everything else. Uh, we're trying. Mm-hmm. That's all I can say. We're trying hard. <laughs> well, getting back to your uh, the new music that you guys are writing and recording. Do you have a general idea of when it may be ready, or is it just way too early to even think about that? Yeah, I mean, hopefully, we if we can get. I think what we want to do first is get out and play some more. You know, uh, the this again, Pat and Todd. There's so much great music that they've already submitted that doing another record is going to be a piece of cake. And we're going to record it the same way, which is basically all of us in the room. We we'll record it the way we did the other ones, as live as possible. Right. Uh, that's still the way I like to make records. I mean, I know now you can, you know, one the drummer can be in, you know, out in Fort Wayne, and and the singer can be in the Philippines, and you can make a record that way. But that's not the way we like to make the record. So, um, well, you know. We're, we'd be able to knock out a record in a month if if we had to. Uh, but we just we just want to get out and play some more. And I really so, would like to do a Kiss cruise or some of these rock cruises or some festivals. Oh and yeah. Just get get the be- because that's that's also another great place to try out. That's the best place in the old days when you had a band and you toured. That again was the best place to try out a new song because you got immediate reaction from the audience. Right. Um, and that's kind of the, you know, I'm, I'm pretty old school that way. And I'd like to work the material up and, you know, through the course of a tour, 
the song gets better and better. Right. You know, opposed to just going into the studio because a studio cut, that just happens to be the, that take that we chose on that day. Yeah. That doesn't mean if we had a chance to, to play it like 20 more times, it wouldn't evolve into something even better. Exactly. So when you so when you get to record this album, who wins out? Are you going to be doing it on the East Coast with you, or are you going to be going over with Todd and doing it on the on the West Coast? <laughs> yeah, we'll do it. No, nah, we'll do it here because uh, <laughs> three, you know, I know Todd's Matt really Todd, he's into the, he's into the California life. He loves it out there. <laughs> yeah, well, he's in Hawaii right now to bomb for his birthday. I saw he's, the uh, picture. Yeah, so he's his birthday was his sixtieth, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now he'll he'll come here because again. We rehearse at uh, Rob Fuso lives about, I want to say, 15 or 20 miles from where Pat and I live, and he's got a really beautiful farm, and he's got a great uh, rehearsal studio, so that's where we rehearse. Pat has a studio for pre-production as well, so it, 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 it doesn't make sense financially because, again, um, if we do another album, it's, it's going to be self-funded, and that's not, you know... So one person flying them, out compared I'm, I'm, to three people flying. <laughs> yeah, and then and the hotel, you know, and hotels. Uh, exactly. that, that's again, it's, it's an expensive. Uh, in the old days, you had a record budget to, to do that. We don't have that luxury right now. Exactly. Hmm. Well, before so I'll put Todd on a pull-out couch. <laughs> yeah, before before we get out of here, John. First, we'd like to thank you for coming on the show. And uh, second, oh, we, want, we want you to uh, promote your websites and Facebook pages and Twitter feeds and all of that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, just visit us on uh, 4 by Fate uh, on our Facebook page. We're working on a dot-com page now. It, it, it's, it's just <laughs> in its infancy. And um, right now, the best place to get information is to uh, just stop by our Facebook page and... Uh, Whatever we're doing, you'll hear about it there first. So, and I, I do. I really. I want to thank you guys for your friendship and support again, and everybody else listening. If it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't get to do what we enjoy doing. And uh, you, you have my gratitude forever for that. So, thank, thank you, everyone. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> There's no thanking us. Thank you. Forgiveness. Yeah. 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 You can't, you can't see together, this now, folks, but <laughs> yeah, you can't see this now, but uh, Dennis is up there doing the, we're not worthy. Yeah, we're not worthy. <laughs> 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 All, right. All right. Well, thanks again, John, for coming on the show, folks. Check us out on ages of rock.com. Check out our Twitter feed, our Facebook feed, Instagram, all of that good stuff. And uh, listen to us on Stitcher radio. And until next week, peace out. Thanks for listening to the Ages of Rock podcast. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and most importantly, tell all your friends. Remember, you're never too old to rock. Until the next episode, peace out, folks. <laughs>